Good morning everybody and welcome to our service for the July the 11th at St John's with St Mary's in Isleworth. This is our YouTube service. My name is David. I'm one of the ministers here in the church. A very warm welcome to you. We're going to start our service with a worship song, Christ Was Raised, a song that reminds us of the amazing truths at the heart of our faith. Okay, for our kids slot this week, I've asked Gloria to help me. Um, Gloria, tell me, what's your favourite film? Jumanji. Okay, now, I don't know if people have watched Jumanji, but in Jumanji there are four characters. Can you name them? Uh, before they go into the game, 
there's Bethany, Spencer, Fridge, and Martha. Okay, and they're already good friends? No. They're very different people who don't have much to do with each other. Do they like each mm. other? Well, they are. They do have. They go to the same school, so they know yeah. each other, but yeah. they don't like each other. Okay, and then um, they enter the game Jumanji. By the way, there was an old Jumanji. This is the newer one I'm talking about. Number one of uh, the newer one. Yeah, uh, and they enter a game, and then to confuse things, their appearance changes. Yeah. Uh, so who are the ca who are they in the film? So Bethany turns in to um, Shelby Oberon, um, played by Jack Black. Um, Fridge turns in to Dr. Mouse, or Moose. It is two different pronunciations in the movie, played by Kevin Hart. Then Spencer turns in to Dr. Bravestone, uh, who's played by The Rock. And then Martha turns into Ruby Roundhouse, played by um, Karen Gilson. Is it Karen Gillian? Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Which is your favourite character? Um, uh, I would probably say uh, Kevin Hart or Jack Black. Okay. So very funny movie. Now, when they're in the film and they're the, the, these new characters and they're in the game, they have lots of adventures. Um, does it go smoothly? Just because they look like new characters, do they get along? No. But by no. the end... They're all good friends. By the end, they're all good friends. And then back in the real world, are they good friends? Yes. Yes. Very good. Well done. You obviously know your Jumanji. You can all watch Jumanji, everybody. Thanks, Gloria. Bye-bye. Well, I just want to say thank you to Gloria for helping us with that. I don't know if you've watched the Jumanji films. They're great fun. We enjoy them in our family. But the reason why I wanted to quiz Gloria about Jumanji is because something a bit like... Um, that happens in our Bible story today. It's an encounter between two people who would normally have nothing to do with each other, a bit like in the film Jumanji. Very different people, wouldn't normally be friends, uh, probably very suspicious of each other, uh, but then they do become friends. And in our story today, they're united in a common faith because God loves everyone. And that's a little bit what church can be like and I hope it is like that where we meet people who might be very different from us but we are united in that God loves each of us and we, res we are responding together. So um, look out for our story today and for an unusual encounter. Thank you. So I'm just going to begin our service with, our, with a few notices uh, this morning. Uh, this is an exciting weekend for those who are football fans um, with the um, England final uh, tonight. Uh, from 4pm we will have uh, a little uh, gazebo out in front of St John's for teas and coffees. Do pop by and say hello. Chance also to pray. Uh, we can pray for you uh, just to catch up really. So that'll, that'll be happening in the afternoon um, if you want to come by and say hello uh, before the game. Um, also to say that we're excited uh, that uh, the rules might become more relaxed around uh, opening up again uh, for church in our buildings. So we imagine a scenario where we'll have less distancing, the, the wearing of masks will be optional, and maybe we'll have some singing. We'll let you know all about that for the weeks after July the 19th. And finally, just a reminder as well that um, to, to just encourage people to consider uh, their giving into church life. Um, thank you so much to those who give regularly through standing order in some other way. And uh, you can give via the yellow buckets in our services in the buildings. Uh, or um, there are many ways to give online with details in the newsletter and on our website. At this point in our service, we're going to have our confession prayer. The words are on the screen if you'd like to join with me. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And so may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Amen. And here's a prayer that's set for this Sunday. Why don't we say it together at the start of our time? Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all that we do through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Robin, a member of our community here at St. John's, uh, will now bring us our reading. A reading from the book of Acts. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does this prophet say this is? About himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and started with, starting with the scripture, he proclaimed the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me start with um, a question. What would it be like for you to have an encounter with someone very different from you? I'm sure most of us would like to think of ourselves as open people, happy to relate to anyone and everyone. And in many ways, that's probably true. Uh, living in a diverse city like London and a diverse uh, borough like Hounslow. But what would you do if um, you met somebody who was very different from you? What would it be like if without much warning you were forced into an encounter, thrust into an encounter? Um, and it might be that you actually had to talk to them and share food or work together or carry out a project. How would you get on? It can, it can be very rewarding and amusing when this happens. Many films play on the idea of an odd couple routine, very different people who forge a connection. Um, but it also wouldn't actually be that easy, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, it might be because of age or ethnicity, lifestyle choices or different political or religious views, or just because we simply can't imagine having anything in common with this other person. So let me play a game. Uh, hopefully you'll see some pictures appearing above my shoulder here. Um, imagine that this person that I'm going to show you is coming towards you on the street. Would you cross the street and try and avoid them? Would you pass by and ignore them? Or would you, could you imagine actually having a real connection with this person, sitting down and talking to them, that they might become a friend, someone that you could trust? Okay, so let's look at these pictures. Um, the first picture, uh, this gentleman um, has, uh, his picture is from, um, I think, a recent um, Pride Parade. We had Pride Month in June. Um, what would you see if you saw him coming along? 
some of this will be different for different people, I'm sure. Uh, now, what about this young man? He's got a hoodie and a cap and um, dark glasses on. Some people may find that that's not a very friendly look. Would you cross the road? What about this old lady? Tempted to ignore her. Now, what about this gentleman? Um, if you saw him coming along the road looking like that, uh, you may not necessarily want to talk to him and become his friend. Um, however, this chap is currently everybody's favorite person in the country. And so maybe you would talk to him. And uh, what about this young lady? Would you become her friend? And this man? How would you respond to him? And this gentleman as well, who looks as if he is without a home. Would you walk on by or would you forge a connection and a friendship? And lastly, what about this person? I don't know what you'd think about that. Well, how did you get on? Um, what would it be like if you had an encounter with someone very different from you? Um, this leads into our story today. Um, our Bible passage is actually a story that's one of my favorites in the whole Bible. It's about an odd encounter between two very different people, uh, but they become united in a common faith. We're studying the book of Acts. These are the amazing stories of the growth of the church in the time after Jesus lived and died and rose again. And uh, two weeks ago, we heard how the church in Jerusalem raised up more leaders, appointed leaders. Last week, we learned about one of those, a man called Stephen, uh, who, after preaching a sermon to Jewish leaders, was ultimately killed for his faith. Ollie helped us with that last week. Today, we're learning about Philip, who was, by all accounts, a friend of Stephen's. But he seems to have, Philip, um, have had a kind of roving ministry outside of Jerusalem to people who weren't Jews. He goes out and around and explains the good news of Jesus in other place, to, to people in other places. And so in our passage today, Philip goes south uh, down to Gaza on what was called the Wilderness Road. And there God's spirit in him prompts him to come alongside a chariot that is traveling south. And in the chariot is a man... We don't know this person's name, but we're told that he is uh, a eunuch and he is a high-ranking official in the court of Candace, um, who, it, it, so in Ethiopia, in Africa. Now, we don't know Philip's reaction to this encounter. We're not really told how he felt about it, but he might have been apprehensive, a bit like maybe we were in those pictures if we came across somebody very different to us. He may have thought, huh, this is not the person I have much in common with. This might be a person who is quite different to me. This is maybe not who I was planning on talking to today. But he, he responds to the prompting in his heart of God's spirit. He's, like, he's aware, what God would like me to do is to have an encounter with this person. Uh, because you see, and hopefully there'll be a picture at this point um, of, a, of a piece of art that depicts it. Philip and the Ethiopian man really were very different. In all probability, the Ethiopian man was a black man. Philip probably wasn't. Uh, in his home country, the man in the chariot uh, was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a wealthy and powerful person, and Philip probably wasn't. What's more, the man from Ethiopia is a eunuch. Now, if you're not sure what that is, uh, let's just say that he is unable to father children on his own, of his own, and that, his fa and that this fact has been decided and arranged for him, for political reasons. In the ancient world, rulers wanted trustworthy officials, reliable civil servants who would not seek to form a rival family or dynasty if they were close to power. Eunuchs had an important function, therefore. They had lost their right to have their own family as part of their service and duty. Um, it was part of their loyalty to the king or queen that they wouldn't have their own families. What makes this even more complicated, however, is that for Jewish people, for those who observed the Hebrew scriptures like Philip, there were laws given by God saying that this was not what God wanted. Societies were not to have eunuchs. Court officials were not expected to give up the chance to have families in this way. So can you see 
From Philip's point of view, the Ethiopian eunuch was socially, ethnically, culturally, many categories, on a different planet. In other words, probably not the kind of person that Philip would naturally have been choosing to hang around with. Someone he might have wanted to cross the road to avoid. But the Spirit of God in Philip prompts him towards this encounter. He draws alongside this carriage. Uh, I always wonder whether he had to run to do that or whether the carriage was moving slowly. Anyway, um, he, he starts to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. What, what happens? Let's read it. Um, so Philip ran up uh, to, the, to the chariot and heard the man from Ethiopia reading the prophet Isaiah. And this is what we read in the Bible. And he asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and so on. Robin already read this. It's a quote from the prophet Isaiah. And the eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? The, uh, the reading his reading of an ancient scroll of the Hebrew scriptures is describing a person who would be humiliated and who would be crushed. Who's this talking about? And Philip begins, begins to speak, starting with that very part of the Bible. He proclaims to him the good news about Jesus. Well, what's going on? Let me try to unpack that a bit more. So the eunuch is reading an ancient Hebrew scripture uh, from the prophet Isaiah that describes someone who will be slaughtered. Philip says, this is talking about Jesus and his death. The servant who will be crushed will be Jesus. Uh, but as it says in these very words of Isaiah, by his wounds we are healed. It's, it's the story of our faith. And from that point, Philip introduces the good news of Jesus, the Son of God, who offers forgiveness and life with God, uh, a gift available to everyone, no matter who they are or where they're from. Now, we don't get the full details of the conversation. It would be good if we did, but uh, we have to fill in the gaps ourselves. But I can imagine that this man from Ethiopia, this eunuch, at this point might start to ask, does this apply to me? Do, is God's love really available to me? Because I don't look like a Jewish person, he might say. I haven't adhered to the laws of the Hebrews. I'm a wealthy black man from another country who is a eunuch. Is this relevant to me? That... This man, Jesus, was, was killed on a cross. Now, what I imagine happened is that Philip kept on explaining, using that part of the Bible. Um, he kept on reading with the, um, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, going through the scroll, because he doesn't finish there. I think he showed his new friend in the chariot that, indeed, God's love is for everyone. Because if you see the chapters that follow in the book of Isaiah, if you were to keep on reading beyond that quote especially chapters 54, 55, and 56, the rest of the scroll that the Ethiopian man was holding, they give the most amazing vision of God's love for all people. As we read Isaiah, we find that this vision of God's love extends to everyone, no matter who they are or where they're from. Nations far away, people of distant lands, widows, orphans, the forgotten and overlooked, will all be welcomed to receive God's love and forgiveness. And I think that Philip would have read as far as, and maybe further than, some verses in chapter 56 of Isaiah. Because this is what we read. Isaiah, the prophet, says, Do not let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Do not let the eunuch say, I am just a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. And then a bit further down, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Did you catch that? I hope so. Uh, try and explain it again. There is a verse in that prophet Isaiah, in that scroll that the eunuch is reading, about eunuchs. And um, Philip, I expect, will have pointed the eunuch to it. What does it say? It doesn't berate the eunuch for his sexuality, gender, lifestyle choices. It doesn't criticize him from coming from somewhere else uh, with different customs and culture. It doesn't draw attention to his skin color or profession. This verse says that the eunuch will be accepted by God 
Remember, the eunuch would not have been able to father his own sons and daughters. But these verses say that he will receive an inheritance, even more or better than sons and daughters, and he will be not just a loyal servant of Candace of Ethiopia. These verses say he will receive the honour of being remembered by name in God's kingdom, with the chance to give his loyalty and service to God, a more glorious and permanent and majestic authority than even Queen Candace. Now, I hope you can follow this, and I hope you can see that it's good news. It means that for us, whatever your starting point with faith, you're never so far removed from God's plans that you can be, uh, that you that you would be left out, cut out. You can still be swept up and brought right into the middle of God's love. Because if it happened for the Ethiopian eunuch, it can happen for you. There is no category to define you that means you aren't loved by God. And nothing that has happened to you that means you can't have a life of purpose and service in God's kingdom. Nothing to do with ethnicity, social background, gender, sexuality. It also means that if you feel you've been left behind in life by things that are not your fault, things that you can't even control, and you were not able to succeed where you hoped you would, maybe even unable to have a family when you hoped you would, or unable to find a community where you hoped to belong, that that is not the end of your story, in the same way that it was not the end of the story for the eunuch. How, how does that happen? How do we get accepted into God's family and brought right back into it? It happens through Jesus. Jesus, the one who was despised, rejected, overlooked, forgotten, so that we don't have to be. He was left hanging on a Roman cross to die so that we might live. At the heart of our faith is that story, that the death of Jesus brings life, and that's what the prophet Isaiah was pointing towards. Isaiah puts it in, in these words, he was cut off from the land of the living so that we can have an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Well, um, finding that the ancient Hebrew scroll of Isaiah was going to speak into his story and speak about God's love. I think this must have blown the mind of the Ethiopian eunuch. He decides he wants to be baptized, so they pull up a chariot. Philip baptizes him then and there. These two men, different people from very different backgrounds, are suddenly now united in faith. They're brothers in the same family. We don't know what happens to the eunuch exactly, but the many traditions of church history are say that he went back to Africa and he started churches there, taking the good news of Jesus to new lands. And new cultures. Let's just finish today by thinking a bit about those photos from the beginning. What would it be like for you to have an encounter with those people um, in the photos? Um, it's hard to draw alongside someone who's very different to us. Um, one writer that I like is a man called Richard Beck. He's a psychologist and he is a Christian man and he talks about how difficult it is for us to, um, to really cross these cultural boundaries or whatever to relate to another person. It's actually natural as humans. We kind of repel, we, we kind of draw back, but we need to be open to God's spirit to push us through that awkward point in order to encounter people who are different to us. Um, it's, very, it's very good. It's very important as it was for uh, Philip and the Ethiopian New Duke. Um, it is harder than, than ever though, I think, to do that. I think um, the pandemic has made it harder. Our older folks in the community to often tell me how there is less talking over the fence to neighbours. We have distractions like phones, many of us are busy, and we feel we have less in common with the people around us than before. The pandemic maybe has helped in some ways, people have tried to connect uh, with each other, but have we have also lost a lot over the last year because of our lockdowns and isolation and without touch or closeness, and with our face coverings on, encounters with people, I think, have been less. So maybe we can commit, as a community, as things open up, to having these kinds of encounters, getting to know people different from us, at the bus stop, your neighbours, uh, even uh, people at work, asking them their story, seeing if we can assist them in some way, like Philip did. He just drew alongside and he said, can I help you? Is there something I can do for you? It turned out that for him, it was explaining the Bible. But for you, it might be something else. And like Philip, why not find a way to share the story of our faith? By answering questions, that's a good way to do it. Um, that could take the form of an invitation to church at some point, 
to people that you've met. Just say, come and see, see what we're about. And we hope that they too can learn something of God's amazing love for each of us. We are deeply connected to Christians around the world. We are one worldwide church. That's another lesson from the Ethiopian eunuch. Our encounters with people right now can have ripple effects around the world. In the same way that Philip met this man on the desert road and neither of them were ever the same again because of the encounter, they, they separated and returned to different parts of the world, living out their faith in new places. That sort of thing happens a lot, especially in a city like London. People come to Isleworth on journey through life. Not all are from here and not all choose to stay. Sadly, over the last few weeks, I've heard of a number of people who've had to leave Isleworth, people that we've known, people from even around church, and will miss these friends. Uh, but we understand that the pandemic particularly, I think, has created uh, new pressures and opportunities for some individuals and families. And so we, we pray that our God's blessing on them as they move. And as they move, we hope that they felt something of God's love here. And we pray that it stays with them and they take it with them into new churches and new communities. Likewise, our church life has been enriched by people who have come here from elsewhere. Over the last year, we've had former members and new members join us entirely through the internet, some of them who live far away. And we give thanks for our diversity. Ours is a diverse church. Let's not take that for granted. We need to celebrate it, enjoy it, value it, and give thanks for it. And we need to be intentional about making room for people from all sorts of backgrounds, as the prophet Isaiah uh, promised. People who are different to us in terms of gender, sexual orientation, social class, ethnicity, whatever it might be. We want our church to be a community that reflects God's love where everybody can thrive. We want our buildings to be places of prayer for all people. Speaking of prayer, we pray for those in our community, like the man from Ethiopia, who feel that home is somewhere else, where the place they come from is somewhere far from here. And may they know that we care about them and the places they come from, that this global dimension to our church family really matters. Well, we could say more about the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. As I say, it's one of my favorites. I felt like there was at least two or three sermons there. So um, we will uh, pause at that point. Um, but uh, I commend the story to you. Go back and have a look at it. And uh, now we'll pass over to uh, Brian, who will lead us in our prayers. In fact, before Brian comes to lead us in our prayers, we'll have a, a song to respond in praise. And then Brian will lead us in our prayers.
Let us pray. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen Sarah and Graham, our bishops, our Archdeacon Richard, Ellis, our acting area dean, and Dave and Ollie here in the parish, and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the royal family. We pray for our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and all members of Parliament, and guide them in the way ahead out of the pandemic. We pray for all the world's leaders as they endeavour to combat coronavirus. We pray for all who work in the NHS and in care homes, and all those involved in medical research. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With a number of sporting events taking place, we pray that the participants in the Wimbledon tennis finals and the Euro 2020 final would respect each other and play the game in the right spirit. As athletes from around the world begin arriving in Japan for the Tokyo Olympic Games, let us pray for the people of Japan, where a state of emergency has been declared in Tokyo as a result of a spike in coronavirus infections, which will result in most venues having no spectators. We pray for the safety of all athletes participating in the games. We also pray for the growth and worship of the global church, remembering our link to St. John's and Gofi in Mozambique. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for all those coming out of shielding, those who are fearful of venturing out at this time, those who have been made redundant as a result of the effect of coronavirus on their employers or businesses, and those who are finding it financially stressful at this time. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. We especially pray for Jeremy Short and David Green and for members of our congregations known to us. Give them the courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole of creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brian, for our prayers this week. Uh, and as we uh, often do, let's finish with the words of the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, have a good week. All the best to England and uh, hope to see you soon. God bless.